Welcome to the Extra Mile Podcast for Bar Exam Takers. There are no traffic jams along the Extra Mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now, your host, Jackson Mummy, owner of the Celebration Bar Review. Well, hey everyone, welcome to episode 216 of the Extra Mile Podcast for Bar Exam Takers. This is your host, Jackson Mummy. Really glad to have you with us. Uh, we delayed recording this podcast uh, right to the very last minute because we wanted to get Florida bar results in. So I've got some late breaking information about the Florida bar results for those of you who are interested. And our message today is actually going to be a little bit broader, certainly than just the Florida exam. We're gonna look at another of the myths about the bar called do more questions. And it's basically the idea that if you do more questions, you're gonna have a better result. I'm gonna try and point out to you why that might not be the case. So I hope you'll stick around for that. If this is your first time on the podcast, I wanna welcome you. We're glad to have you with us. We do uh, these podcast episodes weekly and we prepare them in a couple of different formats. If you prefer to watch the video, you can do that by going to celebrationbarreview.com forward slash 216, that's the episode number, and you can watch the video there and the show notes are right on that page as well. If you prefer to listen to your podcast, you can do that on Apple iTunes, or iHeartRadio, or Spotify, or lots of other places where podcasts are distributed. I think we're on most of them, uh, so check us out there. And you can also check out our website for all of our podcast episodes, going back to the very first episodes. Just go to our site at celebrationbarreview.com, and then uh, click on the podcast button at the top of the page, and you'll uh, be there and can get all of that. So lots of different ways to get podcast information. Now, as I said, Florida bar results came out on Monday, and we've got the very first uh, cut of information on that. We obviously held off as long as we could before a Wednesday podcast to be able to record this part of it. We do have some uh, results that will start to come out now. Uh, later in the month of September, we would expect to see New York uh, results near the end of the month. Uh, we'll have Texas coming along. We'll have a lot of UBE jurisdictions in addition to New York. So there'll be lots of information to share with you in upcoming weeks. But obviously, Florida is the first of the big jurisdictions uh, that comes out. And we want to talk about that uh, in, right now. First, the first thing that jumps out at me is that there is another decline in the overall pass rate, or sorry, well, in all the pass rates, but certainly in the first time pass rate in Florida from July 2017 to July 2018. So here are the numbers that we have at this moment. For the first time takers in Florida in July of 2018, the overall pass rate was 67%. That's not a very high number for first time pass uh, rates. Um, if you go back five years, 10 years ago, in Florida, that first time pass rate number was closer to 75 to 80%, maybe even higher than that. It has been steadily going down. In July of 2017, which is really the comparable exam to look at, and the reason I say that is that Florida results uh, particularly uh, swing wildly between February and July. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But in July of 2017, first time pass rate was 71%. So in the succeeding year, we've seen a 4% drop in first-time bar taker pass rates. Now, that's not good news, particularly not good news for the big box bar reviews because they own most of that pass rate. Most of the first-time bar takers are from uh, several companies. They do most of the preparation at the law schools, and they really own this rate. So at a 67% pass rate, that is not a reason for them to be excited or to be bragging about how they're doing. And for those of you that think you should issue spot and cram and use Iraq writing style, um, this is your answer. You've got a 67% chance of passing on your first try. Now, if you're a repeat bar taker, the news is considerably worse. And Florida does this really odd thing, really the only jurisdiction I can think of that does this. They do not officially report the repeat bar taker pass rate. I don't know if it doesn't matter to them or they don't care, uh, but they will not produce this. And this is relatively new. In just the last couple of years, they've stopped releasing this rate. But we can do some extrapolation and we can figure out some things based on the numbers. So here's what we can tell you about the July 2018 overall. There were 3,250 applicants. Um, and of those 3,250, uh, 1,429 were approved for admission. Now, we know that 1,497 people who were first-time takers passed, so we still don't have all the people who passed that have been approved for admission, and that's nothing unusual. But what that tells us is that first-time pass rate of 67% uh, leaves us with a little over 1,000 bar repeaters. 
based on the overall numbers that we're looking at and extrapolating the number of people who typically are approved for admission but haven't yet finished the character and fitness process, I can tell you that the pass rate for repeat bar takers is somewhere in the 30% range. Now, that's a, a horrible, awful number, but it's very consistent with what we saw in February when we've got more repeat takers than first time takers. So essentially what's happening is that repeat bar takers are heavily loaded in the February exams in, in, Febu in Florida. And in that circumstance, we're seeing a 35% uh, overall pass rate. When we get to July, we've got a big load, uh, really uh, two thirds of the applicants are first time takers, but their performance is down by four points over the previous year. And the repeat bar taker rate we think is actually uh, pretty steady at about 30%. So what does that mean? Well, if you've taken the exam and failed, you've got a three in 10 chance of passing the bar. Now, if you think that that's gonna happen by doing the same thing over and over again, I've got a news bulletin for you and it's not good news. That's part of the reason that we created a webinar that we call Do Something Different. It's really looking at what you have to do to get yourself into that three out of 10 in Florida or wherever jurisdiction you might be in, because we're seeing that same trend across the country. And I wanted to let you know that we're going to do a live presentation of that webinar this Thursday night, that's September 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern. This is an opportunity to look at the four steps you need to follow in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. But it really comes by uh, simply challenging yourself to do something different. And we'll show you exactly what those different things need to be. Now this webinar is completely free and we encourage you to attend, but you do need to register. And you can register in one of a couple of different ways. You can register on the show notes uh, for the video or for the audio, or you can register by going to celebrationbarreview.com slash webinar. So uh, in any of those locations, just click on the button to register. And if Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern doesn't work for you, there's also an option for the on-demand version of the webinar, so you can watch it at your own convenience whenever it works best for you. Now, the difference between the two versions is that obviously I'm live on Thursday night and I'll be doing a live Q&A at the end. And those are always really interesting. Uh, glad to answer questions that anyone has about the bar exam. If you're using the on-demand version of our webinar, um, you can send emails to me from within the webinar and um, I'll respond to you privately. So whatever works best for you, we're glad to have you participate. Just want to make sure that you know that that's an option. Uh, but I would really encourage you, if you have to take the bar exam in 2019 in Florida or anywhere else, uh, to check out our webinar Thursday night, September 20th, 7 p.m. live or on demand. Just go to celebrationbarreview.com uh, slash webinar. All right. Well, as we begin to transition into this results season and we see Florida, the first of the, the big jurisdictions come back, a 4% drop is a big number to drop. And we'll have more to say about that in upcoming weeks. I just wanted to give you the very first hot off the press numbers that we've got. We'll do more analysis on those numbers. I know that some people get really excited about what law school got what numbers. I don't really care. Uh, from my standpoint, one law school is about the same as the other, certainly in Florida. Um, and while there's a big discrepancy in their pass rates, it's not always because one school is better than the other. It's really as much who they choose to put into the pool. And they play a lot of games in Florida. Uh, some of the law schools in this state actually pay their students to sit out the first exam that they are potentially able to take after graduation so that when they sit for the exam, it will not be counted as a first time taker. So if you're wondering why some of these schools that you would think are not great schools are getting great bar results, part of the reason is that they're pretty carefully selecting who takes the exam for them. So uh, again, uh, I would be very cautious and very skeptical if anyone tells you that things are going great in Florida, they're not. This number of about 1,500 new attorneys looks a lot like a quota to me. Um, as one of uh, my staff put it, it looks like Florida's thinning the herd. Uh, I think that's true. And so it's a, it's a very, very tough number. And uh, you know, we're excited. I guess the other question that comes up is, you know, how did our students do? Well, it's very early in that process. We've heard from a number of our students who passed the exam, uh, many of whom were repeat bar takers. So I am reasonably sure that we have done much better than the three out of 10 for repeat bar takers, uh, and certainly our first time takers that we had. And there weren't a lot of those, uh, but they all seem to have done pretty well. So um, I think we're, we're way ahead of the curve here. Uh, I expect that to be true in other jurisdictions as well. And we'll share more with you about Florida results as we get more information in upcoming episodes of the podcast. All right. So now with all of that, 
I want to jump to our main message today, which is part of the 10 myths about the bar exam series that I've been re-recording uh, over the past few months. And in today's message, I'm going to talk about a myth that uh, I think is a pretty important one. And this myth is do more questions. You know, I just got an email from somebody that uh, sat with uh, one of the big box bar reviews in Florida, failed apparently, said I did 7,000 MBE questions and I failed. I think that's a pretty good segue into this myth. So let's jump into why doing 7,000 MBE questions is not a guarantee of success, as this student unfortunately found out. Talk about is one that is so pervasive and so all-encompassing that most people don't even realize it's a myth and they say it all the time. And the myth very simply is, the way I'm gonna pass the bar is just by doing more practice questions. It sounds like a great idea. It sounds like something you should be doing. But the truth is that it's a myth and it doesn't work and it's a bad, bad idea. But I hear it frequently from people when they're preparing for the exam. I often hear things like, the way I'm going to study is I want to do more questions or I need more time so I can do more questions or I want to make sure I've got enough questions so that I can answer thousands of multiple choice questions or I can write hundreds of essays. Um, and on its face, it might sound like a reasonable statement, although candidly, when someone starts saying that they want to do more than 2,000 MBE questions, I question their sanity and their stamina. Uh, it's a bit like taking on a bit more of that beautiful uh, food than you can possibly eat. I mean, the more questions that you practice, the myth says, it should be that the better you do on your exam. But the problem is that that's not true. As we've talked about elsewhere in this series, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. There's not even a one-to-five or a one-to-ten correlation. That is, once you've done a basic number of questions, whether they're essays or performance tests or multiple choice questions, you don't get better by doing more questions. It doesn't work that way. Well, to break this myth down, I want to look at at least three uh, parts of the problem and then uh, talk a little bit more generally about why the myth doesn't work. And I think the first thing that we want to look at is to ask, if you're going to do more questions, what questions are you doing? You know, when I hear from someone that says that they're going to do question practice, typically they're talking about the multi-state bar exam, the MBE. And I typically hear this from students who've taken uh, maybe a three-day course or a six-day cram course, or they intend to do that. And in that particular course, uh, they've been taught or uh, that they're supposed to do 50 questions a day, or 50 questions a night, if you will. Now, any rational person would ask themselves right out of the box, why 50? What's so magic about that? What's wrong with 45? Would that be worse? Would 55 be better or 60 or 100 a night? Maybe that would be twice as good. It's a really arbitrary number. And I've talked about in other uh, videos in this series how that number actually came to be. Uh, it's a pretty interesting story. But the truth is that 50 a night is absolutely arbitrary. There's no pedagogical reason for it at all. And when you talk to people in the industry of any kind of testing profession uh, and preparation, you will hear them say that doing a set number of questions a day is not a way to improve. There's no empirical proof that it makes any difference whatsoever. There's no study that shows that it creates higher scores. It is completely a myth of marketing. And the reality is that this particular myth in the bar review came about as a way of keeping students in those three and six day cram courses busy when they weren't in the course. In other words, it was really more of a class management technique than a pedagogical approach. And there's nothing magic about the number 50 in terms of questions. Now you might say, well, I didn't say I'd do 50, I'm gonna do 25 a night. Same difference, it doesn't make any difference at all. There's nothing magic about doing those kinds of questions. So from that point, I think it's a fairly silly request to make. What about the people that say, well, I'm going to do uh, six essays a day or three essays a day, depending on the length of the essay. Well, it's okay to do for a day or two, but it's not a great idea right before the bar exam. And the people that plan on writing nothing but essays all day long for the last two weeks before the test, well, they get exhausted, they get wiped out, and as we'll talk about later, the work generally suffers. So again, there's nothing empirically that would tell us that that's a way to get a better result. And then, of course, I hear from people who are really freaked out about their performance tests if that's part of their exam. And I understand that, and I understand that it's a part of the exam. But the truth is, you can't really study a performance test. Uh, they're all unique. They're all different. 
And if you're in a course like ours, we'll point out the similarities and the things and patterns that you want to look at. But generally speaking, if you've written four to maybe 10 at the top uh, in terms of performance tests, you're way ahead of the game. Uh, so the people that think they have to do 20 or 30, and I've had people say to me, I'm going to do 25 to 50 performance tests. Are you crazy? There's no reason to do that. It doesn't get you a higher score. So again, while it feels like we're doing the right thing and it feels like you're really energetic and really on it and really excited and enthusiastic, it's really ultimately a huge waste of your time. You could do other things that would be more productive when it comes to studying for the bar. Now, if you're gonna do a lot of question practice, regardless of the type of question or how many you're doing, the second question I think you want to ask yourself is what are you going to do when you study these questions, whether it's the 50 or 100 or whatever. And the answer is that no matter how many questions you do, it won't provide any real benefit to you unless you're reviewing the explanations to the answer choices, particularly on multi-state. That is, if you're just doing questions and saying, oh, I got it right and moving on, or I got it wrong and moving on, you're getting very little value from the question practice itself. This is particularly true, I think, in multiple choice because there are slight differences, shaded differences, nuanced differences between the answer choices, and it's important to understand those and look at those and understand why one answer is correct or better than the other three. Now, in a course like ours, we're going to give you answer explanations for every answer choice on every question. And that's a lot of material to take in. We're also going to tell you that you should look at the answer uh, explanations, whether you got the question right or you got it wrong. So I think it's important to be able to do that. But how do you evaluate and take uh, note of what you've missed or what you got right and why? Well, there are a couple of different techniques. One is to keep a running journal of the things that you missed or principles of law that you need to know. There are those people that think that they should put it on flashcards. You obviously know by now I'm not a big fan of that at all. What we actually recommend is a technique called mind mapping. Mind mapping is essentially a visual technique that engages your whole brain, not just part of your brain, and it creates a visual representation of the material. And we talk about mind mapping in other places, but it's certainly part of our bar review course. And our ex, uh, expectation is that when students do multiple choice questions, that they do 10 questions in a row, and then they go back and look at the answer explanations for those 10 questions. And as they do that, they compare that to their mind map for those topics, or they add or subtract from their mind map as they need to do it, so that there's a constant dynamic interaction between you and the question and the evaluation of the question. Now, that's just uh, multiple choice. And I think it's a better way to do multiple choice than to just do questions and say, I got X number of questions correct out of 100 questions. So I got 75 correct or 50 correct or 40 correct, whatever it might be. That's not a particularly meaningful measure or gauge. Uh, and in addition to that, you're theoretically just studied a subject at length. In most courses, that's when they have you do the questions. So it doesn't tell you a whole lot about your actual performance. So don't use question practice to be predictive unless you're in a predictive model. That is, if you're taking a full length MBE under test time conditions after you've studied all the subjects in a quiet spot, uh, and as I say, under time conditions, then you've got something that might be predictive. And we could tell you what that means in our course. But I think for a lot of students, they take these tests, they have no idea what they mean. They do them with the books open, they do them over several days, they do them without being timed. And then they say, well, look at the score I got. Yeah, so what? It means nothing at all. So if you're not doing the questions under test conditions, time conditions, uh, books closed, uh, mixed subject, uh, then you're really not getting anything that's predictive. Now, can doing those questions be helpful to you in learning the law? Absolutely, provided you do the review that we were just talking about. What about essay questions? How do you review an essay question? Well, in my view, the real value for doing an essay question is really what happens when you're done writing. That is, once you've finished, you need to be able to review the work that you did and compare it to a model or a sample. The problem is that a lot of bar takers think that uh, what they're going to do is just look at that model or sample and then kind of say, well, I was close to that or it was about like that or I would have written about that, but I ran out of time. And that's a very dangerous thing to do when it comes to writing essays. 
No model answer, no sample answer can cover all of the possibilities. And frankly, a lot of the sample answers the bar examiners produce have incorrect statements of law. We've talked about that elsewhere as well. So relying on that to tell you the law isn't going to do it. So what should you do? Well, in my view, when you've finished writing your essay, you want to look at that model or sample to get yourself kind of a balance or a sense of where you are. And then you want to go back to the original source material, the outlines for that subject or subjects. And you want to review what's in those outlines as compared to what you wrote. And then you want to take that information and put it either into a four column exercise. It's one of the tools and techniques that we have in our course. Or again, going back to your mind map and adding it to your mind map for that subject or for that subtopic of the subject. Now, why do we suggest that? Well, the reason is that it's an active form of learning as compared to a passive form of learning. And the reason that I say that it, the other form of just looking at the model or sample answer and saying, well, I'm close, that's a passive way to learn. You sit there, you read that answer that comes in your book, and you say, well, I didn't quite say that, but I would have said it or I intended to say it, and that's kind of close to what I had in mind. Well, that doesn't get you very far in the way of understanding the material or being able to uh, own it and use it if it comes up again. Is it better than having not done the essay? Maybe, but marginally for the time you invest, you don't get much out of the, the investment. So you won't accomplish a whole lot when you just look at the model or sample when you're done and then you put the essay away. I think it's really important to write it, to review it, uh, then to go back and create your mind map or four column exercise. And then finally, again, if you're in a course like ours, to submit it uh, for review from a trained uh, mentor. Now, I think it's important at this point to talk about the different options that people have when it comes to uh, mentoring and reviewing essays. There are courses that basically will say, submit some work, send it in, and we'll give you back a written uh, uh, grade on your score. Well, that sounds like it might be okay, but here's what really happens in the background. If you go to Craigslist, you'll find that most of those bar review companies are actively recruiting people to be their template graders. They don't necessarily even have to have gone to law school or passed a bar exam. That should make you just a little bit uneasy. Secondly, what these companies do is that they give a model or sample answer to the grader and they say, find how many things that from this model answer are in the uh, applicant's answer and then just mark it up with a grade. Well, that's not very helpful. The best way to learn about writing is to engage in a discussion about it. I discovered that now almost, well, I guess, more than 30 years ago at Georgetown University Law Center, where I was part of the writing clinic, and we helped establish that. It's still running today uh, very successfully, probably the most successful writing clinic in the country. The reason the writing clinic started was that we were hearing from uh, big major uh, law firms up and down the East Coast that our graduates, our law school graduates, couldn't write. And that wasn't a good thing, and the, the law school wasn't happy about it. And we said, well, but we give them writing assignments, and they get grades on their essays, uh, their answers to questions, their, their, their work that they do. And then um, I had the opportunity to work with a brilliant uh, woman uh, by the name of Jill Ramsfield. And Jill uh, was the real pioneer in this idea of writing conferences. And her approach was that if you actually sat down and talked to people about their writing, you got much more engaged. You began to understand what they were doing, and they began to see the work from the viewpoint of the reader. That was critically important, and that made all the difference. And as we started to talk to people, even a 10 or a 15 minute conversation about a piece of writing, writing improved dramatically. Now, I wanna make this point here because some of you have trouble with writing essays or performance tests. If you think you can write one from a course and just look at a model or sample answer and fix your writing, um, I'd like to tell you that's true, but I can't. It's delusional, it doesn't happen. What you really need is a teaching mentor to help you with your writing. Now you might say, well, I'm getting back a grade from my big box bar review. Yeah, that isn't gonna do you much good. It doesn't tell you what's really going on or why. And the source is not very useful. The best way to do this is to build a relationship with a teacher or a mentor, someone who's actually capable of evaluating your work and showing you what needs to change and also showing you what's working. So again, my point is just doing the questions without the follow-up, without the mentoring, is really a time waste uh, that doesn't get you very much value. I know that's a little discouraging to people, but that is the reality, I think, of the bar exam today. And that's really true whether you're talking about essays or performance tests in every jurisdiction. Well, the third part of the problem that I see it uh, is to ask, what questions are you actually doing? 
Now we talked about how many you're doing and what are you doing when you review them, but the third part is what questions are you actually doing? And this is a really big topic when it comes particularly to the multi-state bar exam. You see, not all bar review courses questions are the same. There are questions that have licensed multi-state questions, and by licensed we mean they come from the source, the National Conference of Bar Examiners. Now, how do we get those? We pay a very large royalty uh, to the National Conference. And in exchange for that, we're licensed to provide past questions. The same is true on the uniform bar exam with the essays and the performance tests. Those are all licensed and they come to us from the NCBE. And the royalty that we pay for those questions is hundreds and hundreds of dollars per student. Now, as you can imagine, for a big box bar review, that's a very expensive proposition. And in fact, it's so expensive that most of the big box companies simply choose to not participate at all. So what do they do? They write their own questions. Why? Because it allows them to save money and to make more money. Uh, not that they really need to make more money, but they are obscenely uh, uh, wealthy and they are uh, driven by private corporations and hedge funds who want to make even more. And so buying uh, license questions is simply out of the question for them. Now, there are some uh, mentors and teachers that try to game the system and cheat. Some of them go to faraway places and they try to steal the exam and remember questions and pay students to give them the questions. And some of them have even gone so far as to stuff the tests in their pants, uh, but they've been caught and they've been sued. The point is that many of the large bar reviews, in fact, nearly all of them write their own questions and their own answer explanations if they do that at all. And you might think to yourself, well, a question's a question, and what difference would it make? But to paraphrase Freud, sometimes a bar question is just a bar question, and sometimes it's much more than a bar question. You see, there are a variety of degrees of difficulty on the multi-state bar. If you've thought that all the questions are the same, if we use a degree of difficulty of one is the easiest and 10 is the hardest, they're not all fives, they're not all ones, and they're not all tens. They actually follow something that looks like a bell-shaped curve on the exam. And it is very difficult to write questions that are of a degree of difficulty of two or three, some that are fives and sixes, some that are nines and tens. It is really technical and very specific work. And in order to do that, you have to put the question out and evaluate it and test it and compare it. And this is called psychometric testing uh, principles. And they're very difficult and expensive to do. And that's why the bar examiners uh, charge a high royalty to have access to those questions. So my point is that there are lots of different approaches, there are lots of different ways of drafting a question, but it is not easy to write good essay or to write good uh, multiple choice questions. It's also not easy to write good essay questions. Try it sometime and see what happens. Now, the reason that the National Conference goes through all the effort to create these evaluation questions before they become real and live is that they want to get the right psychometric approach, the right consistency and reliability of a question, uh, so that when they put it in the exam, they can be confident that it accurately measures a student's uh, capabilities. We've talked about the reliability indicia in other videos, and essentially the National Conference claims a reliability index of 0 0.90 on a, a 1.06 scale. So they would claim 90% effectiveness of being reliable uh, of indication of success as a lawyer. Interesting, isn't it? Well, when you try to write your own questions and the way that the big box bar reviews do it, and I was part of one of those companies uh, at one point, is that they throw a bunch of editors in a room and they say, quick, write us up 250 new contracts questions, let's say. Well, you're going to get 250 really badly written questions without much uh, value in terms of testing or reliability or teaching. And it's really not a good practice at all. And the problem is that then you've done those questions as a student, but you haven't learned much and you haven't prepared for the test. So the reality is that for most of these people that are doing 50 questions a night or they're in a big box bar review, they're working with questions, and maybe this is you, uh, but those questions are either much, much harder than the actual bar exam, or more likely in terms of one or two of these companies, they're much, much easier than the actual exam. And the theory behind this that I've heard is that on average, it would be okay. Some are harder, some are easier, but you'll be okay on average, which to my mind is like saying, put your head in the refrigerator and your feet in the oven, and on average, you should be comfortable. Really? It doesn't quite work, does it? You see, I believe and have always believed that you need to work with the real thing. Whether it's a multiple choice, an essay, performance test, it's got to be the real thing. Now, the real thing doesn't mean that you're going to see those questions word for word on the exam. 
No matter what anybody tells you, that is not going to happen unless they've cheated and stolen the questions. Um, and that's a whole different ball game, and uh, I can't imagine any of you want to be part of that. But the idea of using license questions from prior exams is that now in a legal way, uh, without copyright infringement or intellectual property right uh, questions, you are able to see the tone, the structure, the principles of law, the approach, uh, and even in some cases, how the graders would uh, put together their point sheet, how they would evaluate the work, particularly for essays, and that is invaluable information. Now, this same idea of using licensed or real questions applies across every jurisdiction and in all uh, uh, forms of the exam. That's why in our course we don't use any questions that are not released questions. There is one, uh, there's only one exception to that, and that is in the state of Florida, where they don't release their multiple choice questions, they just keep reusing them over and over again. But with that one exception, every question in our course is an actual real question, whether it's an essay or a performance test or short answer or uh, whatever it might be in whatever jurisdiction you might be in. So I would tell you that it's important to use prior questions. It's far better than using made up questions. And it's important to look at the quality of the questions that are being used in the course that you're taking. So that's why we only use uh, one kind of question. Prior questions work much better. All right, with those three ideas then, those three concepts in mind, why then, returning to our initial question, why is it a myth to say doing more questions will lead to higher scores? It seems reasonable. It seems like if I've got the right questions and I'm doing them properly, I should get higher scores. The problem for me at this stage is that it's too simplistic and it ignores the reality of what we have thought of as the three-legged stool for studying. It's the balance that you want in your studying. So even if you overcome all three of the problems I've just described and you're still thinking that you want to do more questions, here's why it doesn't work. Now, in a course like ours, we use this idea of a three-legged stool to stay in balance. One of the legs of your study is doing your reading. Now, whether you're doing photo reading in our course or you're doing traditional left to right 110 word reading, uh, you want the basic foundation of the material that the outlines provide. And if you're trying to study without doing the reading, as some students do, well, you're going to be in trouble. You just simply aren't going to be successful. This is a fundamental component to being successful on the bar exam based on our 25 years of experience with thousands of students. Well, that's one leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool is watching or listening to lectures on that same material that you've just read. And the idea here is to reinforce or clarify what you've just read, to pull together different ideas, to give you examples, to help you take this material, which is incredibly detailed and dense, and make some overall sense of it. Very important to do. And again, I hear from students that say, well, I'm just going to read and do practice questions. Yeah, that doesn't work either. And there are people that say, well, I don't want to waste my time listening to lectures or watching lectures. Well, it's not a waste of your time. It actually consolidates what you've already done. So just as it would be foolish to ignore the reading component, it's also foolish to ignore the lecture component. And then, of course, the third leg is the one we're talking about today, the idea of doing question practice. Now, when you're doing question practice, along with these two other uh, parts of our three-legged stool, what you're really doing on the overall sense is you're engaging as many of your learning senses or multiple intelligences as possible. You engage, first of all, your visual senses when you read. And if you're a photo reader, you're actually doing even more than that. But at a very minimum, you're engaging the visual sense. Then you engage your sense of listening, the oral sense, oral like your ears. Uh, in uh, listening to a lecture or your eyes in watching the lecture and kinesthetically you're engaged because you're taking some notes you're creating mind maps or uh, making your notes in a traditional style whatever that might be in fact there was even a bar review course in new york for many years that uh, insisted that all the students write down word for word uh, everything that was being said in the lecture well that was not very practical and it gave people real severe hand cramps long before uh, computers came along, but that was the idea. They were ahead of their time kinesthetically, they just didn't understand uh, other things about uh, technology and studying. But the point was that you wanted to engage as many senses as you could. 
And then finally, when you come to dealing with the hypotheticals in a fact pattern, when you're doing practice questions, now what's happening is that you're engaging all of these senses uh, that you've used before and you're creating new synaptic uh, pathways, new neural pathways and synaptic connections in your brain because now the hypotheticals start to come out in stark relief. You can see the fact pattern, you can see what's happening, you understand how it appropriates and uses the law uh, to help resolve conflicts. What you're doing is putting the law in context in your question practice. You're learning how to use what so far has just been abstract principles. What will happen if you're really engaged in the process and you're doing it in equal balance is that you will see patterns, you will see repetition, you will begin to see how the law actually works rather than just viewing it as a series of random uh, disconnected principles or elements. And that's what we call in our course, and we've trademarked it as selective intuition method for uh, question practice. And we'll show you how to do that so that you actually are using your intuition selectively to build on all of those tools. Now, if you do all of those things in a balanced way, statistically, we know that you're going to do better in being able to retain and use the information. And the goal of all of that ultimately is to get a higher score on the bar exam. Now, to be clear, that is not memorizing. It's the opposite the polar opposite, in fact, of memorizing. But it's being able to retain information and then being able to use it so that you can demonstrate the skills that are really being tested. Can you make a cogent argument? Can you use the law to support that? Can you see the distinctions in the law and how they apply in a given fact pattern? And whether you're taking an essay or a multiple choice part of the exam, the idea is that in your study, in your preparation for the test, you wanna stay in balance on our three-legged stool. So this myth becomes dangerous because if you start doing question practice to the exclusion of reading or lectures uh, or staying in balance, you're going to get the stool out of proportion, out of balance, and you know what happens, it tips over. So essentially doing question practice by itself, it isn't really bad, but it's not very productive. And that's what we're trying to make sure you're, you're focused on. The study practice you do has to be deliberate. It needs to be focused on specific tasks. It needs to be done in balance. You need to be working on the right questions and the right number of them. If you're not doing those things, or if you're working with bad questions, bad subject matter, uh, poorly drafted questions, or poorly written answer explanations, unfortunately, then you're wasting your time. And that's why this can be such a dangerous myth. It's literally a time suck, particularly near the end of your studies. So if you find yourself saying, you know what I'm going to do to pass the bar is just to write a bunch of practice questions. I'm going to write essays and performance tests all day. Then I'll take a bunch of multi-state questions at night uh, and I'm going to kill this thing. Well, I got to tell you, what's going to be killed is you. Uh, you'll get tired. You'll lose focus. You'll start doing mediocre work. This is particularly true when you start trying to write a lot of essays over a long period of time. Uh, your hands and your wrists will certainly cramp whether you're typing or handwriting. You'll become really irritable uh, and you will not have learned very much. And ultimately, that's a very poor combination for you. It's bad for your bar study. Uh, it's not good for your ultimate bar score. And most people around you are going to stop talking to you because you're going to be a real pain in the rear uh, to deal with. Well, there you go. <laughs> what do you really think, Jackson? In any event, I hope you'll think a little bit about this and think about whether or not the course that you're taking or the approach that you are planning on is really properly balanced. Are you using the right kinds of questions? Do you know what to do with those questions when you've got them? Do you know how many questions to do so that you stay in balance? When you put all of this in the proper perspective, the questions can be a vital part of improving your performance on the, on the bar exam. But trying to do them to the exclusion of everything else is a myth that will harm you on the exam, will keep you from being successful. And ultimately, the point of doing question practice is to be able to realize what you're capable of, what you need to work on and improve, and what you can safely set aside and know you'll be ready on exam day. Well, that's our message for this week. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. Encourage you to think very carefully about how you're doing your studies and your questions. But I also want to encourage you, if you're retaking in Florida or just taking the bar exam anywhere in 2019, to check us out on Thursday night for our free live webinar do something different. Make the next bar exam your last bar exam. You can register here on the webpage uh, at celebrationbarreview.com or in the show notes for the video or the audio or by going to celebrationbarreview.com slash webinar. So lots of different ways. And if Thursday night doesn't work, again, there's an on-demand version of the webinar. 
I hope that uh, those of you that took the Florida bar that your results were favorable. Uh, for those of you waiting for your results in lots of states still to come, we wish you all the very best. We'll keep you up to date as those state results start to come in now. The pace of results will pick up pretty dramatically as we get near the end of September, and we will uh, bring you all of that information as we get it uh, and uh, can pass it along to you. So for everybody uh, who's uh, waiting for results and for everybody who's getting ready to take their exams in 2019, thanks for being with us this week, and we'll see you next week along the extra mile and on the pass list. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at www.celebrationbarreview.com. <laughs>